All right, so I'm going to introduce what we're doing next. If you choose instead to work through it because you're like, I got a Friday deadline, completely understand. I'm going to post this video um, on the announcement so you can always go back and watch it later if you're like, oh, what, what did you say about whatever that was? Yeah. You should be looking at a work of art by Benjamin Franklin. Yep, the guy that's on the $100 bill. Uh, ben Franklin not only was one of the founding fathers, he was an oddly short-term president that we never talk about because he was kind of president before George Washington. And that's when the capital was in Pennsylvania. Uh, so he was just basically filling in until they found somebody. Incredibly brilliant guy. He did the first political cartoon, which you can see here is this cut up snake with all the pieces being all the colonies that were rebelling kind of against each other and threatening to make a bunch of little separate kingdoms like in Europe where he was like, we're stronger together. Uh, so the, the topic that we're going into here today is political art. Uh, political art is uncomfortable knowledge. It's not supposed to make you feel happy. It's supposed to, in a non-violent way, express an idea which you're supposed to try to wrap around your head and decide whether you like it, dislike it, agree with it, disagree with it. And for hundreds of years, political art has been moving people and uh, making huge, Im uh, huge impact, not just on art, but in the world around it. This is a piece from 1937 by Pablo Picasso. It was the bombing of, a, of the town Basque in Spain, where the Germans, where the Ger Germans had decided to do a practice bombing run that lasted for three hours and killed 1,600 people. So even though this is an abstraction, this is probably one of the most important political statements that have ever been painted. And I don't like Picasso. I'm going to go straight out and tell you, I don't like Picasso, but I like this. There's something about this painting that I think really goes beyond what he normally does. And it is a black, white, and gray painting. It's also about, I don't know, 16 feet by eight feet, seven feet, something like that. It's a very, very large mural. All right. Now, you get the sense, you get the sense of panic in here. You get the sense that something has gone horribly wrong. You see people screaming off here in the side. You see even this horse looks panicked. Um, distorted faces are here. The emotion from this painting projects beyond its canvas. So when you look at it, you can feel what's going on in here, even though it's abstract. Does it communicate clearly what war this is or what bombing this is? No. So you have to bring a certain amount of knowledge to some of the political art to understand it. All right, uh, here's one back from the 80s. This is a piece with the yellow figures done by Keith Haring. Ignorance equals fear, silence equals death. And this is all about AIDS. So there was a point where people didn't talk about AIDS. You know, they were afraid to bring it up. Um, some of them felt that it was only a gay thing, which, you know, it isn't. But because people weren't talking about it, people were getting ill and actually dying. And so his attempt to get people to start talking about it uh, really helped, at least in the art community, people opening up and those people spread to other people. And they said, look, you need to talk about it so you can get help and treatment and uh, probably saved a lot of lives. All right. Also, Freddie Mercury, if any of you guys saw the Queen movie, um, he didn't admit he had it till basically he was dead. So had he admitted it earlier, maybe something could have been done. All right. Over here on the right, all the free speech money can buy. What's the comment there? Anybody figure that one out? It's a heck of a statement. 
What does that mean? All the free speech money can buy. How about this? If a wealthy person wants to get his point of view across, and Mr. Velado wants to get his point across, who do you think is going to reach more people? Anybody? You guys even awake today? Wow, the warmth I'm feeling. The man with the cash, the rich person. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because we may all have an equal um, status under the law. But the guy with the cash can afford to throw his cash around and get his message out. And that's why there's a lot of millionaires in Congress. And there's not too many Mr. Flatos <laughs> in Congress. Um, wealth is power. So, uh, you know what? Yeah, we have the freedom of speech. But if I stand on a corner yelling about something I'm passionate about, they're probably going to ignore me. You know, whereas the guy who can afford a million ads on TV, ah, they might start to remember his, uh, his commercials. All right. This is a Banksy one. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Banksy. Banksy is an artist who... Uh, He's, he's kind of a criminal. I mean, is the way he's, he's a vandal. He takes and he paints on other people's buildings without asking. But he goes out in the middle of the night. I think he has a crew with him because he's got to have spotters so he doesn't get caught. And nobody knows what this guy looks like. That's kind of the cool part of Banksy. So Banksy must be independently wealthy to begin with. And then he loves art. And so he just goes out and he does this. What happens with his artwork, because it's done on walls and buildings, is a lot of times people cut out the wall or cut out the building and they send it and try to sell it. And sometimes it works, like Brad Pitt bought a, a piece of his um, for a couple million dollars that somebody cut out of their garage. Uh, and sometimes nobody can move it because it's a wall and who has space for a giant cinder block wall in their house? So what do you think, what kind of statement is this making? What, what political issue is this bringing up? I remember when this was trees. What's it saying about the world? Yeah, there used to be trees here. <laughs> it used to be pretty. It used to be better, you know? Can a kid play on a brick wall? Yeah, maybe if he's got a tennis ball, a tennis racket. Can he climb a tree? Probably a lot more, more uh, likely that he'd be willing to do that, hang out in nature. Uh, so this is actually an environmental argument, whereas some of his other political stuff is all about war. So normally when you would have seen the original image for this picture, that guy would have had a Molotov cocktail, which is a gasoline filled bottle with a piece of cloth hanging out of it. Really a horrible, unstable bomb. Uh, those things always scare me every time I see one in somebody's hand, because you've seen enough pictures on ridiculousness to know that you don't start a fire with gasoline. It's not controllable. But instead of the Molotov cocktail, he's got a bunch of flowers in his hand. Right. right, in the riots. Here we have a bunch of soldiers graffitiing a wall, a painting of a bunch of soldiers graffitiing a wall. Uh, this is kind of a hopeful image. It means even the soldiers don't want what? <laughs> Yeah, they don't want war either. So there you go. Um, going back to the 50s, you have a series of paintings by Norman Rockwell. 
that I think are some of the most amazing uh, political statements and paintings of the last hundred years, at least in America. Norman Rockwell was usually an illustrator. Um, he did covers of the Sunday, Saturday Evening Post. What we see here is the first uh, black child who was going to school in the white school. And she is basically having to be escorted by US Marshals because that's how high the tension is. She doesn't look afraid. I would be afraid. Um, we see tomatoes thrown at the wall. You know, there's a lot of dissent here, but people are pushing so that the world can be right for everybody. And sometimes we have those fights, you know, a lot of times we have those fights. Um, but I think this one captures that struggle fairly brilliantly. I do like this one a little bit better um, because it's that moment. It's that moment. Is the world going to become a better place? Is the world going to become a more separatist place? You got the white kids meeting the black kids in the suburbs. All right. Are they all going to be friends? Well, let's hope so. Absolutely brilliant painting. All right. Put on. Shepard Fairey is the guy who did the Obama Hope picture. He also did the We the People series. We the people are greater than fear. We the people protect each other. We the people defend dignity. What's he saying about the makeup of America? Basically, he's putting a face on what America really looks like. It's diverse. And we're all trying to get that same kind of equality. Um, political protests for the George Floyd. Sadly, I think the bottom writing across his shirt kind of sums it up. Shame it would have to go that far, ever. All right, a couple other ones, and I'm gonna let you guys start to think about it. This is one by Francis Kruger. Wow, man, I can't believe that name popped into my head. Um, Francis Kruger would take other people's images, and then she would put a word or a phrase over them. So it would repurpose the image. And we could get into a wonderful aesthetic debate if that's legit can you really steal somebody's painting or photograph and and rechange the narrative um well it appears that you can <laughs> she's done it her stuff sitting in museums um what is this saying about these two people here because i'm pretty sure the original one was this guy flexing his muscle and the girl being impressed what does the title do to the meaning of this image Anybody? You guys could answer, or we could write a paper about it. Thank you. <laughs> no men needed. All right. I mean, it's not quite as cut and dry as that. She's just basically saying, you know, we can be our own heroes, uh, we can fight some of our own fights. We don't need a man all the time, all right? We don't need someone saying, oh, I'll help you out there, little lady. Yeah, we've moved beyond that as a society and hopefully as people. Thank you. All right, have I dwelled into the political arena? A little bit. Uh, my third book is all about people getting ready for a war. So I didn't know what to do with my chapter headings. And one of my friends, she suggested, why don't you just do propaganda posters, political propaganda posters from, uh, from the 40s and change them. And I went, all right, that sounds pretty good. So most of this was drawn, done in ink, scanned into a computer. All these fades were done on uh, Photoshop. 
even the shading here was done on Photoshop. Whoops, my bad. Where'd you go? Get back there. And of course, I did one of the most iconic feminist images. Also, I just substituted my own characters in there. All right. So if you want to take a previous image, much like Kruger did, and redo it, repurpose it, add something different, do a different point of view. Um, I urge you guys to do that. Try it out. I would like to see pre-sketches um, by next week. All right, so we got a deadline of the um, skeletons. We've got deadline of the scene set for Friday. Preferably earlier is better. Thursday would make me very happy because then I could do it in between school and my meetings. Thursday will be awesome. And then start thinking about your political ideas. I would go online, I'd research this, I'd pull up other images, see if you agree. Look where your stance is. Do you want it to be about the environment? Do you want it to be about equal rights for everybody? Do you want it to be about um, you know, equality for women? Do you want it to be about the environment? I want about anti-war. Um, Pro-war, still creepy, but yeah, um, you're going to make a political statement with your next piece. And as far as materials, we're looking at oil pastels, because I know I give you guys some oil pastels. I believe all the three fours got chalk. If not chalk, you can uh, opt out and use watercolors. All right. Yes, the big picture, I'm glad somebody asked. Uh, the big picture should be on the big paper. So for both my three fours and five six, three fours, your skeleton should be on that big sheet of paper. Um, at this point, if you haven't started, I would go back and look at some of the comic book art where there are large areas of dark, like uh, Hellboy, Hellboy comic uh, by Mike Magnolia. Uh, really good at that. Frank Miller is another guy, the guy who did Sin City. Uh, huge areas of darkness will take you less time than doing a, a gazillion hatching. You have to do hatching at some point regardless because, well, you got to try to shade it and create form. Um, I would also think about putting something up close. You know, if you were to take and make a photo out of what I'm doing right now or a drawing, my hand is 50% of it. You know, so if you have a skeleton reaching for a candy bar on a shelf, which seems weird, but possible, or a frosty beverage, and then you had the rest of the scene behind him, that would be way easier to do than everybody in the distance. Because if you get stuck drawing just nothing but background, it takes a really, really long time. All right. And the same thing for the guys, uh, five sixes who are doing this, the scene, setting the scene. Um, like I said, I don't care if you do it in ink or if you do it in pencil, you could even do it in watercolor if you got those, um, or on a canvas if you have your own materials. But, you know, putting something up front allows you to focus the majority of your skill on that closer object. And then the background kind of, while super important, kind of becomes a secondary thing. You know, most people are going to look at the thing up front, like even with me speaking now. There are very few people who are going, what are all those shot glasses? What do they all say? You register them, but you don't really care that much about the detail. So, you know, probably most of you don't see that I have uh, uh, Rick Sanchez's uh, teleporter on my amplifier back there. Because that's not what you've been looking at. So there you go.